one of the challenges for those of us that don't consider ourselves um, talented or connoisseurs or anything like that is to start to trust our own capacity for discernment because we all have it and we seem to race past it all the time. So <clears throat> we don't take time to really school ourselves in these matters because we live in such a fast paced world and a world where, you know, there are logos and mottos like just get it done. And in this time of COVID, which has forced us to stop, forced us to slow down, forced us to really meet ourselves, um, to learn more about ourselves, to spend some time with introspection. Um, this is giving us an opportunity or an invitation to really look at what it means to be discerning. So rather than dismiss our personal uh, peccadilloes and what the cost is to ourselves and to others, we should really be curious about that. You know, it's the question of, well, am I just really set in my ways? Or is this something that matters to me? Is it a value that I have? It is, is it a principle that I stand on? And if so, can I discern what is what? So for example, I know for myself, I've been sort of sailing along, you know, gratefully during this time of the pandemic where I've been safe. And I also have the privilege and luxury of being safe and been grateful for the rest and the time to myself and the time to be um, with the people I'm closest to and whom I love in conversation, if not in actuality. But this weekend, I noticed I was starting to feel kind of listless and slothful and not very motivated to do anything. And so I asked myself whether I was depressed. And I'm not a person who, again, luckily has ever been prone to depression. And I realized, no, it wasn't depression. It was something else, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And so when I really thought about it and did some investigation and then started asking other people, I got a lot of reflection back to me that, yes, everyone was feeling this way in my particular circle. So things from people who are saying they're not putting up a Christmas tree for the first time in 40 years, or the event that they hosted every Christmas is not happening this year, or they're not going to see a grandchild because um, you know, they're worried about getting sick or getting someone else sick. And so these are discerning moments where we have to figure out what is going on with us first before we can think about what's going on in the world. And then also this discernment about, yeah, I think it would be okay to go visit my friend for Christmas. But then when we really, really examine all of the factors in that and discern whether it's truly okay, we may come back to what is being told to us, which is to really just stay put. And for as much as our inner child or our adult child doesn't want to hear that, it's about discerning what's good for me and what's good for the good of the whole. And certainly what's good for all of the medical staff that are suffering greatly right now due to the pressures and stresses they have of taking care of us, that we come back to sitting still because that is a nuanced discrimination of what the right thing to do is. So with that, we can also think about how discriminating we are with other things and with people and certainly with picking relationships. So I've been thinking about the number of times that I've indiscriminately bought things, not really discerning whether I truly want this thing. Do I really like it? Do I need it? Um, what am I doing here? And whenever we buy anything impulsively or whenever we get into a relationship impulsively, we're not discerning at all. And I think one of the things that I've come to about discernment is that it requires a slowing down, a slowing down of our thought process, um, getting clear about what we're actually feeling and what's true for us because we can so um, 
much be influenced by the culture and the pressures around us and the need to just grab something and go. I mean, there's even food called grab and go. <laughs> there's no discernment in grab and go. That means you've got like a 20 minute lunch break, you're starving and you just need something to put in your mouth. And that's fine and what a great convenience that's very different from slow food or slow dining. And I'd like you to think about that also in this moment, when you think about a potential mate or your current partner and whether you use discrimination in your attention with that person on any given day, are you really looking? Are you really listening? What are you actually seeing, especially if you've been you know, trapped with your spouse for the last eight months in the same place over and over again. You know, people are either ending their relationships at this time or they're deepening them. And the deepening requires this quiet discernment and this distinguished um, attention that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna stop here for a question. Uh, Someone says, I'm a love addict who's in relationship with a sex and porn addict. I've just begun to seek healing for my side of the street instead of blaming everything on him, which I would say that is fantastic because one of the things I think we have to look at is um, how discerning we were when we chose our current partner. Um, and if we start to see things we don't like about them or that are really true for them, that's not their fault. They were always who they were. It was our lack of discernment that had us getting into relationship with that person to begin with. Um, so this person goes on to write, I know the desire to be emotionally connected to my partner is normal um, and healthy, but given my history, I know I tend to consume my partners, if that makes sense. It does make sense. How do I discern the difference between a healthy expectation and desire to be emotionally connected versus wanting to consume them? Well, I think your answer is in your question, that when you want to consume someone, when you want to gobble them up or swallow them or be a part of them, that tells you that you're not really healed, that you are looking for um, the kind of attunement and attachment and comfort that you didn't get early, early on, possibly even in infancy, but certainly in childhood. And that it's not our partner's job to um, you know, be our everything. It's just too big of a job for anyone. So when you can um, have a desire to be connected, which is what you've written, that a healthy expectation and a healthy desire to connect without that feeling of, I have to glom onto the person. I have to know where they're going at all time and what they're doing because my abandonment trauma is so intense. Then you'll have the answer to that question. So I would suggest that you go back to the drawing board in your therapy and in your program and really examine these um, anxious um, abandonment issues that come up for you where you feel like you're going to die or going to be left uh, because somebody is not in your scope because you can't see them or know where they are all the time. Uh, because that can feel incredibly suffocating to someone else. And as I said, it's just too much for one person to bear. And Stephen writes, as a recovering sex and love addict, I'm learning to listen to my inner child. My physical, emotional boundaries were crossed constantly as a kid. In active addiction, I was incredibly impulsive. Can you talk on the relationship between boundaries and discernment? So when emotional boundaries are violated as a child, um, that telegraphs to the child that they actually don't matter. Um, that their very sense of self is being impinged upon rather than their sense of self being cultivated, rather than the parent being curious about the child, rather than the parent honoring the child's boundaries, of course, within reason, um, keeping the child safe. And so it makes sense that you became impulsive, probably because you were incredibly angry about the lack of recognition of your own personhood, that you didn't get to develop a self 
um, or a, a sense of who you were, that it was always about what other people needed. So when I think of that kind of impulsivity, I think of anger and rage and really rebelling to say, you know what, I don't, I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it because nobody cares about me. And so as an adult, um, and this is true for pretty much every question, part of being an adult, a functional adult, is to stop rebelling against the ghosts, the ghosts in the nursery, if you will, the ghosts in our childhood, because we're fully formed adults now. And instead of doing something impulsively to stop, um, and that's why, you know, they talk about this in the program, you know, your first thought is not the best thought. It's your second and third thought that you want to pay attention to. So to say, wait a minute, is this really true? Do I really want this person? Do I really need this experience? Do I really need to spend money on this thing? What is it actually doing for me other than I'm just super activated and I need to grab onto something or I need to have some sense of control in my life? So my best recommendation for you is to slow down, make a program call, check out your impulse with someone else or a couple of someone else's so that you can really get a reality check on what's true for you. Someone asks here, does, does discernment apply to both romantic relationships and friendships? I would say yes. And is it possible to practice discernment too much and overthink or hold unrealistic expectations in those relationships? Well, certainly it's possible to overthink everything, but when I think of discernment, I think more about um, intuition um, our instincts, which are not about thinking at all. Thinking will exhaust us. Thinking will have us making the wrong decisions because we just analyze something to death, or it can actually be quite um, obsessive and compulsive to think and ruminate and perseverate and run around in our heads like that. When you can quiet that part of the brain and you can dive into the body by closing your eyes, taking a deep breath, and asking yourself, when I think about X, when I think about this person, when I think about buying this thing, what does it feel like in my body? Do I feel tightness in my chest? Or do I start to feel queasy in my belly? That will give you your answer about what is true for you and what isn't. And your left brain, your thinking brain, will always try to override that. There will always be a yes, but from that. But that is the power and control center of our brain. Whereas the right brain in the body is where our intuition and our instinct lives. And typically what's most true for us. And so when we stop comparing ourselves to the world and what other people think or other people want or a family say we should do, and we really get quiet with ourselves, with our own hearts, that is a place of discernment. It's quiet, it's nuanced, it's clear, and it's what's really true for you. Can you go over the difference of discernment over being overly judgmental? Well, again, being judgmental is a left brain construct. It's opinionated, it creates separation, it doesn't give you any answers. It also keep, uh, serves to keep us separate, I believe, from others. It's not an invitation to move in closely. It's a judgment and it's a wall to be separate. So I wouldn't even think about those two words in the same breath, actually. See, here's another question here. How do I take healthful discerning steps in relationship to myself and a man I'm interested in and have spent a year getting to know where I want monogamy and he wants sexual intimacy with others. Um, I'm feeling sadness and anxiety and unsure how to proceed. Well, I would say that's your answer. If you're feeling sadness and lack of certainty, then that is a red light. That is a sign to stop because you're already saying that you want different things. Um, and you say your pattern of, of dating is going along with his agenda and labeling your discomfort as growth pains. And so I think you've answered your question here that that is a resounding no for you. And so you have to grapple with why you're not listening to your no. Because the pain of saying no to him is one pain, but the pain of saying yes to him 
And going down the road he wants you to go down that isn't true for you is a world of pain. And it's a pain that's going to take you much longer to get out of. And you could conceivably waste months, if not years of your life, following his road rather than your own. So I want you to invite yourself to be brave here, to say no, to say, I'm going to end this relationship and deal with my withdrawal symptoms and deal with uh, the lack of um, having something distracting in my life um, and dive deeply into my loneliness and pain to discern what's really there. Uh, someone writes here, growing up in an alcoholic home and also surviving a childhood with several years of sexual molestation, my young adulthood was filled with sexual promiscuity, which I later understood was trying to meet needs of mine that were neglected early on. Can you please speak to one's ability to only discern on the level of one's wound and not above it? By this I'm saying, until I was able to heal my lack of self-love, how could I discern how healthy or unhealthy the love of a potential partner was? Well, I would say you cannot because when you suffer that kind of abuse, typically you're struggling with dissociation and that kind of dissociation cuts off every experience in our bodies. So it's very dis difficult to discern anything. So that's a really good question. I think discernment is a higher order function in the brain and in the nervous system and that until you have some integration of yourself, you have a stronger sense of self, it's very difficult to work in this world of nuance in the way that I'm talking about. Um, so I think that's a good question. <clears throat> and hopefully, um, I would imagine you've done enough work that you can even make the discernment to ask a question like that. Um, and that capacity for discernment is more available to you now than it ever was. <clears throat> so I'd like you to think about what happens when you get into a relationship with someone, how the focus might be on all of your lover's strengths and their attractiveness and their qualities um, and how they bring out the best in you and that you start to really get excited about what you value in that person. But the flip side of that is also discerning that you are in a high limerent state at that time. That there's a lot of excitation in the system. There's a lot of excitation <clears throat> because that's nature's way of bringing us together with someone that we are attracted to. But don't let that excitation dull your senses, dull your capacity for discernment, dull your capacity to really discriminate about what is reality and what is fantasy, especially for those of you that identify as love addicts. See if you can pierce that love addiction bubble and ask yourself difficult questions about, <clears throat> do I really like this person? Am I really listening to what they're saying or am I just really in la la land as it were, imagining what it would be like to be married to this person or living with this person or running away to you know, Tahiti with this person. Can you get present in your own body and be discerning about who they actually are so that you can identify wisely and honestly who they are so that you're choosing that person as opposed to just lunging at the relationship and lunging at the fantasy where <clears throat> you wake up three months later in bed next to someone and you realize you don't even know who they are. And we've all had that experience. <laughs> so slow down, slow way down and get curious about all dimensions of the person you're involved with, not just the one you want to see, but the shadow side also, because we all have a shadow side. We all have a dark side. Um, let's see, someone says, due to my childhood development and trauma, I've operated most of my life as a very codependent partner. How do I practice discernment while having a strong codependent personality? Well, I think that requires that you spend a lot of time in the codependent literature. And part of having discernment when you're codependent is saying no. And saying no more often than yes. 
and really getting clear about why you're saying no, as opposed to the perpetual habit of accommodating the other person in order to make yourself feel safe. So I would turn your attention to a book that I love by Melody Beatty called The Language of Letting Go, which is a daily reader like Mirror of Intimacy, only that book is for codependents. Um, and every single day there's a topic that gives you permission to stand up for yourself, to say no, to be discerning, so that you're taking care of you first and foremost, and not everyone around you, which is exhausting. So I would say that your discernment is about saying no more often than yes. How can addicts that are recovering trust their intuition or gut? How do we know the difference between healthy interest and love versus addiction? And again, I think that's about sticking close to your program. If you're really working the steps, if you're really engaged in your program, that process will start to show up for you because this is sort of a later stage recovery um, capability, if you will, and not something that you're going to know early on. In early recovery, it's really about surrender. It's about taking the next indicated action. It's about suiting up and showing up and doing what you're told to do because your own internal compass has been so skewed, whether it's from your childhood abuse or your addiction, which has obscured things also. So make sure that you're not putting the cart before the horse here and trying to do things that you're really not capable of doing yet. <clears throat> How do I deal with my feelings when my long-term partner goes between ignoring me and suffocating and demanding of affection? He's a high-functioning alcoholic. Well, I would say you should go to Al-Anon um, and be discerning about uh, taking care of yourself and getting into a program that will help you answer those questions. <clears throat> I'm not able to discern whether my acting out on my partner was 100% my addict or a mixture of my addict and dissatisfaction with the self of our, our sex in our relationship. Any advice? Well, the answer, it's always your addict. If you were really honest in your relationship, you would go to your partner and say, I'm dissatisfied with our sex. And if we don't get help or do something different, then I want to see other people. That would be an honest, discerning thing to say. So whenever you're cheating on your partner and lying to them, you are in your addiction. And if you're not an addict, you're cheating and lying. But there's nothing discerning there. True discernment would have you being honest about what you're doing. Um, how, do, how can one find a healthy balance between trust and red flags? Embrace and distancing. How do you know your own inner so signals when so much early programming has been done around obeying authority figures from childhood and having personal integrity dismissed. Yes, the authority figures are mostly likely gone, but the feeling that one's own knowing is not a value lives on. That's really a deeper therapy experience um, or question. Um, it's also one if you um, are in a 12-step program that you always surrender to your program because your best thinking is problematic because it's been skewed because of abuse. So this is why it's important to have a community of concern, to call other people, to check it out with other people. You know, Patrick Part Carnes talks about living a life in consultation. And that is one thing that people who have great success in recovery do until the day they die. They don't make decisions about relationships or important things in their lives without checking it out with, uh, with trusted others. And if you can't um, develop that kind of humility and vulnerability, you will always struggle because you'll be stubborn and you'll always wanna make your own decisions or you'll get advice from people who know what they're talking about and you'll ignore it, uh, which is not really being emotionally sober. So making sure you have a community of concern is really important to this matter of discernment. How do we learn to trust ourselves in discernment? And I believe sometimes believing in my discernment and then other times doubting. Well, I think that goes back to the last uh, answer that I gave that really, if you can't trust your own discernment, if you can't trust your own intuition, then you need other people to help guide you um, into the right place. Um, how does one slow down the getting to know process when dating? Well, I think a dating plan is useful for that. And also oftentimes people just move way too fast in dating. 
you know, they go out with someone on a first date, instead of setting a time limit that it's going to be a two hour date, they end up, you know, like six hours or they sleep over with the person. That is not going slowly at all. That's really lunging at the process. And especially now, if you're going on Zoom dates, you make them time limited. You say goodbye, even though it's amazing and you feel like all these great feelings and you think this person's really cool, you have to set a boundary and say, we're done here. And that boundary setting is a self-respect measure. It also telegraphs to the other person that you respect them yourself and that you hold and keep your boundaries. So not texting incessantly, not seeing the person all the time, just being realistic and making a plan that you can adhere to and that you also check out with other people. You know, have a friend go over the dating plan with you. Is this realistic? Can you stick to it? And that will have you slowing down. Uh, COVID has certainly popped my love addiction bubble. Yeah, I think it's been helpful to a lot of people for that reason. The honeymoon period in my relationship didn't really exist due to the pandemic. It forced me to actually see the person I'm with and the person that I am. Other than slowing down, what are the other ways I can work on staying out of my codependency? Well, I think, again, paying attention to and making maybe making some lists about what is codependent behavior versus self-care behavior. And this is a very fine line. And I think you have to have a lot of recovery around your codependence, again, to be able to discern this line because part of the purpose of a relationship is secure functioning, is the, the ability to regulate our partners and be regulated by our partners, to ask for help when we're struggling, to ask for what we need from the other, but we're not always gonna give it. And not only are we not always going to give it, we're not, we should not have to sacrifice ourselves repeatedly to make our partners feel okay. So if, for example, you know, my partner twists his leg and he needs me to take him to the doctor, I drop everything and I go do that because it's important to take care of him and it's for the good of the whole. But if every day he's asking me to not work out, um, miss my lunch, um, not have enough time to shower, brush my teeth, or I'm constantly having to accommodate and take care of him, that is not about um, healthy discernment. That is codependent. And that person's pulling at me to give up on myself and not take care of my own needs to accommodate them 100%. That's not a healthy functioning relationship. So I would encourage you to get very clear about what's codependent and what isn't, what you can do, what you shouldn't be doing, and then share those with your partner. And say, these are the things that I want to do, um, that I wanna to contribute to the relationship and I wanna help you with, and these are the things that start to feel like I'm losing myself. How do you trust your own discernment when you keep falling into the same old rules and roles of a system that so failed from the beginning? There's so many traps that I unconsciously participate in, like looking for co-regulation with a partner who wants to perform in order to be accepted. Well, again, I would say that you're probably not choosing well and that you should examine these patterns with a professional or in a program. During a heated argument with a loved one, is there a way to quickly calm down and get into a discerning state instead of reacting with regretful words or actions? I realize that we need to be in a place of quiet to have full discernment, but is there a way to get some portion of it quickly so that damage is prevented? Well, really what you're pointing to is that in order to have discernment, our prefrontal cortex has to be the dominant operating system. Um, and our prefrontal cortex is what distinguishes us from animals. It's what allows us to engage in abstract thinking, to imagine, um, to create in many different ways. And that function also allows for discernment because it requires stability in the nervous system. So if you're in an argument, you're no longer able to discern because you're a different part of your brain is operating now. And the capacity to hold and wait, to think, to be clear is not there. We're just now reacting for a more, from a more primitive part of our brain. So the best thing anyone can do is say, look, we need to take a time out. This is not going anywhere. It's devolving. Um, I don't want to say things that are hurtful that I'm going to regret later. And so let's just stop and let's agree to take a time out. And I think those agreements have to be made with the couple 
at a time when they're not fighting, at a time when you're talking about what kind of relationship do we want to have and how do we want to treat each other? And if we do get into an argument, can we agree that we are going to stop? And when someone says, I want to time out, that the other person agrees that no matter how hard it is or how much they feel rejected or abandoned, that we're both going to stop and take a time out. And whether that's for 15 minutes or an hour or half a day, you have to agree on what you need, then you do what you need. And a timeout is not a time to avoid or retreat or get retaliatory and childish. It's a time to cool off, to think, and to think about what was my part in what just happened. And when both people have discerned what their part was in what just happened, then they should reconvene and own their part in it to each other instead of blaming and shaming each other. And that actually helps a relationship grow and change. Are there a set of questions we can ask ourselves each time we experience a situation that requires us to practice or contemplate discernment? Well, <clears throat> again, I think you have to slow down and you maybe it's helpful to get quiet and close your eyes and ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? And what am I feeling in my body, not in my mind? What does my head think I'm thinking or feeling? But what am I actually noticing? Do I feel a tightness in my chest? Do I feel butterflies in my stomach? Does my heart ache? Because typically we feel our feelings in the core of our being. So our, our heart and our gut is where we have other neuronal networks. So what is my body telling me? And from this place of how I feel, what is it that I need? So what am I needing right now? So if I'm feeling hungry, I need food. And then the next question is, what do I want? Because what I want is sort of a luxury item. What I want might be Chinese food or Italian food or a cup of soup. Um, then we get to discern what we want. But when we're thinking about what we need, a need is a fundamental, non-negotiable issue. If I'm hungry and I need food, that is a, a survival need. So if I'm feeling really sad right now and I realize that what I need is a hug from someone, then I have to ask myself, where am I going to get that hug? Because I want a hug. And right now, that's a difficult thing to come across, if, especially if you're single. But you've got to discern who a safe person would be to get that from right now in your immediate circle of friends or family. And then you have to ask for it. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a physical need um, or it's an emotional need. Maybe I'm feeling really sad and what I need is to talk to somebody. And what I want is to talk to my best friend, even though I know she's busy right now and she's in the middle of her work day, but I am going to ask for what I need. And I might not get it right now. She might not be able to call me back until five o'clock today, but at least I'm asking for what I need um, and I'll probably get what I want. I might not get it in the time frame I wanted, however. Let's see, we have a question here. I have a mild porn addiction and I have no partner. I take uh, medications for depression and social anxiety. And this pandemic, my addiction increase. I want a real partner, no fantasy sex or watching porn anymore. I feel so drained and mentally tired um, and no focus when I'm suffering. And no partner, how can I get rid of sexual thoughts and unhealthy behavior? Um, because I don't have a social life during in this pandemic. I walk every day. I listen to music. Um, it's so hard to try to connect with someone um, of the opposite sex, confused, low self-esteem. Um, I haven't worked for eight years because of these problems. And let's see. So it sounds like um, you are pretty isolated from what you're saying, Fred. And so I would encourage you to find online support groups. There are lots and lots of them right now. 
Um, I know you say you have a mild porn addiction, but you might do really well in a fellowship like Sex and Porn Addicts Anonymous. Um, and if you Google that, you can find Zoom meetings. And there are Zoom meetings all day, every day right now uh, when it comes to 12-step programs. And so there are also lots of online forums for gathering um, that I would encourage you to really start looking for so you can be in relationship with other people. There are online workshops right now for all sorts of things. Um, I think if you also call our intake line, you could probably talk to an intake counselor who might be able to give you resources. Um, we have a porn addiction group here that's online. So your major challenge is to get out of isolation and it starts with other people. It doesn't have to be people of the opposite sex, just other people so that you can learn what it's like to be intimate and relationship with people, um, not just so lonely and alone. Someone asked, does discernment practice clarify both what we want and what we don't want? I would say yes. I've had a long on again, off again relationship with someone for eight years. And I think my discernment is that I don't want a relationship in my adult life. Well, if you don't want a relationship, then this on again, off again thing is probably serving its function. And if that's what you come to, then that's a choice because there's no one correct way to live. You get to choose whether you want to be with somebody, be alone, be in a polyamorous situation. Um, you get to run your life the way that you want to, as long as you feel like you are um, happy and joyous and it's, um, yeah, it's giving you the fulfillment that you want to need. All right, so there, um, in our daily healthy sex acts today, I want you to leave you with this thought. And um, when you go to the produce section of your local grocer, or if you're fortunate to live in a warm climate like Southern California and you're going to the farmer's market, I want you to think about differentiating between the fruits and vegetables that are good from the ones that are the very best. Because oftentimes we'll just grab an apple or grab a banana as opposed to really examining the skin. Does it have any bruises in it? Does it have any flaws in it? Does it have any imperfections in it that would make it less than delicious? And we're not talking about perfection here. I'm not trying to get people into perfectionism, but I do think there's something really sensual about like noticing the skin of a banana and how it's sort of thick and soft at the same time. And then it has specific ridges in it. And some of it's yellow, some of it's brown, sometimes it's green. Um, also, what does it feel like? It feels sort of meaty and hard. And of course, people like their bananas at different levels of ripeness. Um, if it's super right, you can smell it and smell that delicious banana smell. So spend time grocery shopping when it comes to produce this week. Give yourself some extra time to really notice um, what's going on with the produce that you're buying. And then um, pay attention to your judgments today in all situations you find yourself in. And how can you be more discerning about your choices and decisions, whether it's the food you choose for lunch today or the coffee that you make or the conversation that you have with someone? And be discerning with how you treat yourself most importantly. What is in your best interest, not in a self-centered, narcissistic, me, me, me way, but in a place of self-compassion and self-esteem, a place that makes you feel like you are loving you, that you are your best friend, that you have compassion for yourself in a way. So take good care of yourself, be discerning, and I wish you all a very happy holiday season, a safe holiday season, and ask that you do one thing today to get yourself out of isolation. Uh, whether it's engage in a forum like this, I guess we could say you already have done, um, or just calling a friend. So please remember that you can find Mirror of Intimacy on amazon.com. We love your reviews. Um, and to remember that this can be a lovely holiday gift for someone that you care about. So take good care, happy holidays, and I'll see you in January.